computer assemble visual images in the same way you might put together a jigsaw puzzle so for example instead of telling the computer a machine learning algorithm that uh, if it has a whisker or if it has a pointy ear it is a cat you are just giving hundred or thousands of images of cat to it and letting it figure out that having a whisker and having a ear in this direction is a cat so machine learning is not something giving uh, you know specific rules that press uh, in an image if it is present it's equivalent to some class instead you are giving n number of samples to it and making it learn on its own that the cat would have these structures so and that is how a machine learning algorithm can say this is not this might look like a structure of a crow but it is actually a cat so let's go forward how do we use this in healthcare domain so you can see plenty of uh, you know domain in ap application related to healthcare so mostly in in if you if you find a cv in healthcare anywhere you you would first recognize this application which is early and accurate diagnosis i think but given an image be it a pathological image be an x ray being a ct image you are diagnosing whether there is a presence of any uh, problem so for example from an x ray you can detect fracture from a ct scan you can detect from a lung ct you can detect covid that's what is going on right now in, in high demand or early diagnosis meaning before even the covid could come and hit your lungs you can find some symptoms in the lungs that can you know show you that you might get covid soon something like that in tb you can find it early diagnosis so that's more important application where uh, there are so many uh, already have been started years ago and it's uh, still going on and the next one you could find is anomaly detection anomaly detection is nothing but it's not like you are going to find a particular uh, problem given an uh, you know biomedical image you're going to find whether a given image is problem free given a lung whether it's a normal lung you don't have any problem at all given a pathological image you are finding there is a difference finding cancer from a pathological image and then finding given a patholo pathological image it is just problem free so that's what is basically is going on in anomaly detection in biomedical and there are surgical logs surgical logs meaning if say a doctor is performing a surgery and uh, by that time there will be a, a camera recording the surgery and it would be logging the efforts put in by the doctors around you nothing but if the doctor is actually you know cutting a, a skin it logs it down and it if you have removed a tissue it would be logging it down automatically that's been going on in surgical logs which is very much uh, you know it's like a monitoring and it is very much useful because uh, not everything can be noted down by human and computer does it automatically will help also for learning for medical students i mean whatever the doctor does during a surgery and it, and it's point by point it is logged in and a medical student can learn from it so that's how that works and the next is uh, genomic medicine genomic medicine is nothing but uh, dna uh, where you deal with dnas and rnas etc so you have a structure of dna you have structure of rnas and you find problems from it how uh, what is the um, uh, characteristic of a particular dna and how it can be matched to other dna etc etc it's all also comes under genomic medicine so another thing is health monitoring given a patient uh, if a patient has a you know a problem with heart and uh, you have to find if if he's you know in say in coma and he has to get up and he's has recovered from coma and he has to do all work by himself you are monitoring him how how is he 
how is is ana i mean how does he move and what's wrong in his movement and you just uh, monitor the whole patient and then find if something is wrong with his movement there's something called bait analysis in uh, uh biomedical i mean uh, kind in monitoring the patient so you do all these things to monitor whether if something is going wrong with the patient uh that's health monitoring health monitoring is not only in cv it is also in other sensor based uh monitoring like monitoring heart rate monitoring sleep monitoring everything basically all all sensorical data and there comes drug discovery uh drug discovery is like um you have a uh, protein crystals it's like biomolecules and they bind together and you have to find this crystal structure which is not that easy because there are millions of structures available and uh, throughout the years it was done using human uh, you know visual inspection how the crystals bind and how the crystals behave for each drug that you give the protein crystal so that has been automated now and uh, uh, whatever uh, you know you get uh, whatever the drug that you give how this is behaving how the protein crystals are behaving how it is forming a crystal it's like more than one biomolecules will form into a crystal so that's where drug discovery is uh, going on see these are all the places where computer vision helps you know in automating more than uh, what human can do so let's see one of the application which is quite rare in uh, industry right now and it's also more valuable so there is something called dna comet analysis and what is this dna comet is nothing but there is some uh, you know this this comes under genomic medicine and also in drug discovery uh, this this deals with both of the applications so Uh, to start with there is an experiment which is conducted uh, which is nothing but scg single cell gel electrophoresis it's called and what they do is like they take the cells of uh, any um, uh, species normally they take the cells of fish which matches the dna with human and i mean there are some percentage match with the human dna for some fish so they take those uh, it's called japanese medaka fish and then they th take those cell and they uh, eggs actually once the female gives in the eggs they take those eggs and they uh, put those eggs in the containers of different con concentration of different uh, you know element uh, whatever element is under study say say that there was a drug discovered and they find it is helping the first test they find is whether it is affecting a dna or not because if the drug is out and if it is affecting a dna that might lead to cancer uh, so that mutation should not happen so for that we need to find whether any element it be it be a drug or it be it be any new food element or anything you have to first discover whether the, it causes any damage to the dna so to do so they uh, take those element and then divide it into different concentration like uh, 10 mg i mean um, nanogram etc based on the elements characteristic and then they make the egg grow in that element with some uh, with some in the element some in the water so because water doesn't uh, do anything to the uh, dnas so we know what is the equivalent performance of this you know um, damage caused by water and damage caused by this element should be almost equivalent if the element is non genotoxic so after a few uh, you know days they take and then they segregate a single cell and then they dye the cell with some uh, you know dyes this dyes can be ethylidin bromide which can give red color and there is some other uh, dye which causes green color and all they dye it and then there is this process electrophoresis which is nothing but you must have learned in your uh, 12th standard or 11th standard something so you have this cathode anode 
and then you know this negative charges will flow towards the anode etc etc so whatever that you have in the dna if it, the the if the element has actually damaged the dna it starts moving and when it starts moving it forms a shape of a comet and that's why they are all called dna comets so it can form it it forms the you know this this is a perfect comet that you can see and this also sometimes form this kind of formation so basically when it moves there is head portion there is tail portion like a comet so this analysis is made when once it forms this comet you know uh, formation then there comes the analysis how much damage is there uh and for that they take millions of images uh, under the microscope so basically this all electrophoresis will be happening on multiple cells on um, on multiple dnas and then they take those images and then there will be in one experiment you will be have so many images and all from all the images you have to find how much damage is there which cannot be done you know with just human in visual inspection for that we need you know computer vision's help so as i saw as i said before so this is how a comet will look like after it has stained and after, during the process and uh, when it is just in an intact inact circle then it's called undamaged dna and when it forms this tail it it is damaged and how far the tail is tells you the level of damage so comet tail and comet head is what you are going to analyze so before you know having machine learning or computer vision algorithm on it uh, people used to have some common source or uh, open source tools some common uh, methods to find uh, automatically uh, you know the level of damage so there are a few uh, these are the you know mostly used commercial software available so what they do is like what they have their own drawbacks because obviously it's it does not in, involves a generalized you know algorithm so the problem with these are all like one assumes the head diameter and height of the comet is same which is nothing but i mean if the height this is the height of the comet and this is the head diameter right so it assumes the height of the comet is head diameter which is so for a perfect comet but if it is un If it is not perfect like this, then it's not the case. So that also and also it requires manual annotation. Like, uh, where is the head? Where is the tail? You have to just click and then tell you this is the head, this is the tail to the software, and then it tells you what is the diameter of the head and what is the height of the comet, etc. And also there is something called open comet. which assumes all the comets are symmetric meaning like if the both side of the comet should be same having this but that's not so in all the cases sometimes if it is heavily damaged it just leaves the head completely and it becomes like this then it becomes asymmetric so in those cases it fails and if it is too damaged it fails so those are the problems so what do we do with with this tail and with this head is that we find a uh, different measurements of a comet we find the cell area we find you know head dna meaning how much dna is there uh, in the head how much dna is there in the tail so these are all something that we find which is nothing but some intensity you know value measurement from those images uh the the color information tells you like there is a presence of dna because the dna is stained when it moves it takes the colors with it so how much color is there will give you the pixel value its pixel value tells you how much color is there because black is zero whatever the color is there is has a value and that is the intensity of that color so that intensity will tell you what is the level of dna there so how much dna is present in head in that in that uh, you know context they will tell how much color is present in the head how much color is present in the tail and will tell you head dna percentage tail dna percentage and uh, head length is nothing but head diameter and tail length is 
from the end of the diameter till the end of the comet day. So there are multiple uh, measurements they make out of a comet. And then with this uh, values, they tell you the, you know, they quantify the level of damage, whether it is heavily damaged or just damaged very less, etc. So not all the measurements are performed every time. So uh, there are very uh, important measurements happening, which is like, hey, DNA is more important and uh, how much tail length is there is more important. Like not every, every parameters are important. So now we try to solve this problem using key point regression. So I, I hope everyone must have heard this on facial key point uh, detection. So basically what happens is that uh, we uh, detect the eye key points, eyebrow points and et cetera, and we map the face and then we will recognize the face or we recognize the emotion of the face. So uh, having this, having said this, so this can help the same uh, problem that we are dealing with the comments because uh, this is nothing but an alignment problem. Like when the head is aligned this way or that way, we will get some information based on that. I mean, if the lip is closed, no expression. If it's not, if it's, if it's a smile, then there is a expression, etc. So using this, using the same algorithm with the comets, we can find the alignment or the shape of the comet. These are the key points that you can extract from the comet. And then you can map them as you align for the face. And then you can find, if you do this one, then this is the radius of the head. And this is the tail length at the end of the radius to the end. So this is how we measure it based on key points. So in this way, we thought of solving this problem. So basically this is how a comet assay will look like. Assay is nothing but one uh, picture that you take from the microscope. And then it, it, it contains more than one comet in it. And it also contains something other than comets like contaminants. Uh, bacteria or something else other than the fish DNA you might have something else also in it and that doesn't contribute to the uh, damage analysis and these are the something that we have to neglect and there are some other things like this which is based on human error you know while conducting the experiment something must have fallen something must have not like that so um, the problem is here, is it, as everything is in single color and we have to neglect what are all non-comets, we have to consider only comets. So we have to do the whole, also we have to consider only damaged comets. So these problems we are solving step by step by this complete uh, framework that you can see here. First is detection of valid comets in the assays. Like you detect only the comets because not, there, are, there are other things other than comets available there. You have to neglect them. So for that, we used a detection network, which is uh, you know, faster RCNN, uh, which is nothing but it's, uh, it has a neural network and then uh, and classification layers, ROI pooling. I'll explain each thing like, in detail. So uh, post the detection network, you will get the boxes, bounding boxes around this comets. And then it says this is a valid comet. And this is not a valid comet like that. And from that, once you get a valid comet, only the valid comets are, uh, you know, sent into another sequential network, which gives you the key points around those comets and with which you can align the comet and then based on some intensity calculation on convex hull methods you can find the uh, measure, estimate the measurements like head diameter tail length head dna percentage etc cetera, etc cetera. once you get those points it's very easy for you to actually you know find those measurements so um 
coming to this detection network, uh, this faster RCNN network. So uh, from given an image, it will be given given to a CNN network. CNN is networks are if you have this multiple convolutional layers also pooling layers in it so this will give you some features uh, giving an image to a cnn cnn here is a fully convolutional network meaning you have only convolutional layers and pooling layers other than that you won't have any whole dense layers so that any you can give a size of any image. I mean, image size need not be the same. Once you give that, you'll get some features out of it. And uh, you have something called region proposal function. I'll tell you what is that. You get a feature maps from the uh, CNN. And on that, you have a sliding window which moves along and then will give you val each value for each anchor box. So now what is anchor boxes? For, for example, if given this image, you know the comet is contributed of this size. So you know what the head, height and the width of the size. And here the height and width is same. So for a particular application, the aspect ratio of the object that you need to find can be different. Height and width ratio is aspect ratio. So how, how different your aspect ratio can be? How much difference can you give to an aspect ratio? That many different anchor boxes will be established. This is something that you give uh, beforehand. Like you will tell, I have an aspect ratio of one is to one, uh, meaning the head and width, I mean, height and width will be same. And it can be this way, portrait way, landscape way, any way, or two is to two, one is to two, etc. Tell n n different types of anchor boxes. If you're not much, uh, you know, no, uh, you don't know about your data much, or you don't know how 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 the object can be different, or how much difference can you have sizes in the object, etc. So uh, that many anchor boxes you give, and it will it will give that many uh, you know output from this uh, RPN layer. So basically it tells you the coordinates of those anchor boxes present in that particular feature. What are the coordinates is 4K. Means if you give four anchor boxes, it will give four into four coordinates, meaning this XY and this XY. So X1, X1, Y1, X2, Y2 will give you four values. And for each anchor box, you have four values of this uh, coordinates. And then it gives another thing, a score. Given an anchor box, whether there is a your object of interest is present or not. And it will give you whether it has a or not. So you have two values, meaning two classes if you have, how much classes you have, that many classes score you will be having. For example, if there is a comet present in this box, it will tell there will be 0.9 is the score that the comet can be present. And 0.1 is the score that the comet might not be present. So it's a probability value, having a comet inside or not. So you will get these values from this, uh, you know, uh, region proportional network. And then after that, you give it to a ROI pooling, which is region of interest pooling. Meaning given whatever the input says, you are, you, are uh, you know, changing it to particular size. Because at the end, you have to give to classification layers. These then uh, you will be having dense layers sometimes, and that needs a particular size. If you don't have, it's not needed. The R over pooling will, will take the region of interest and then divide only that portion, but not the all portion. That's the main thing that we want to see here. And then you give them to a classification layers. And then you get the, at the end, you get the box coordinates, and then you get what, I mean, uh, what is the probability that the class is present? That is here is comet is present or comet is not present. So now you get box coordinates. From that, you can crop the comet off. Take the comet. Give, give tho those comet image, which is also an RGB image. So you give it to the sequential network. This network at the end has since output layer of 42 will give you 21 key points. As you can hear, see here, if you count this up, it will be 21. So it's 21 key points where one is the center of the head, another is our 
uh, you know, one one key point. So each has an x y value. So together it will give you forty two values, which is twenty one key points. And with that key points you can align them. So this is a normal sequential CNN network, just very basic one, which is like you have convolutional layers, uh, you know, dense layers, dropout layers, etc. So, uh, so the whole framework is this: you detect comets, and you, you know, take only these these two are valid comets, and others are invalid. You neglect them, and uh, you regress the key points uh, around the comet, and you find this alignment, connect the key points, and then you estimate the measurement. These are the measurements. So, these are the most important measurements. Like normally, people use to define the damage in the comets. Now, if you want to know the implementation in detail, you can see in this uh, my GitHub profile. I'll tell you like what what and all you can actually find informative from there. So you will be having the whole comet analysis. I mean, DNA comet analysis, what are the modules per percent and how do you quantify and everything here? And then there is some extra, which is like we have developed an application for that. If you upload a comet image, it will give you this prediction, meaning whether you have a valid comet and if you have a valid comet, what is its head length and tail DNA percentage, which is not um, no open source now. And you can recreate it. Always, we have all the codes here. This is nothing but if you even have this code contains. If you even have, you know, uh, if you have a classification algorithm present, and if you want to create a GUI for it, this could help you. This code might can help you object detection or any model it be. So, how do you create a web application for that? And a complete, you know, Keras uh, implementation of faster RCNN. Will be there, and you will be having other analysis on the comet. So, what is I mean, uh, how I mean, you can recreate this, and if you want any help, I mean, on this one because this is something that uh, if you if you if you can see this DNA comet analysis, if you find it, you know, in um, if you Google it or if you find it, you can see like very few papers. And one of it is nature paper, and so uh, yeah, it's it's in highly demand. So if you if you feel it is uh, worth a try, you can try. And if you want any trained model or you need any help, you can always contact me in this email ID. So so any questions, please ask. Uh, everyone, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat box. Yep. So I just want to know like about uh, the audience. And uh, so uh, can anyone, the, the organizer, someone can tell us like what year of uh, you, I mean, undergraduation are you guys in and what's exactly going on? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we are currently like uh, it's a mixed bunch. Like uh, there are third year students, second year students, first year students are also there. Okay. So uh, because my, I know the content of this uh, might include complicated information as well. Like some might not know CNN, and I'm going deep into you know some complex uh, structures of CNN, etc. So there are all the 
that's why it also has a high level of you know how, how it would help in healthcare domain and what are the uh, applications you can find in healthcare domain and how you can go forward in it so um, i mean anybody anyone who has any doubt on that architecture or level or anything that that's quite complex to hear can always you know ping me or ask me or mail me anyway Guys, if you have any doubts, you can just place them in the chat box, or uh, you can turn on your mics and ask it. Okay, so we have uh, two questions in the chat. Okay, but I cannot see the chat. I guess it's like only for members. I'll just uh, dictate the questions to you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Ishan is asking, with the help of computer vision, can we simplify complex laparoscopic or robotic surgeries? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, so, robotic surgeries. See, uh, for example, like if we are, uh, it's it's all based on the movement, you know, the hand movements at all. So, with based in computer vision, you can always uh, use for localization purpose. Given the camera on the you know robot uh, vision and where exactly the robot hand should move to that uh, you know uh, local lo local place on the say you are concentrated on a tissue and using computer vision you can detect where the exact position of the tissue is present on the image and when you find that you can you can move the robot hand to that place localize that place and then use in that way you can actually use but ultimately the the overall uh, is under is under supervision it's not like automatically can be done with a robotic hand but because all uh, you know tissue if you if you segment a tissue from the um, image you you can always find the mask found as segmented tissue and the robot can crop the tissue off from that, but it won't be accurate, as accurate as a uh, human does when, when the robotic surgery happens. But the detection, this localization, is where the computer vision helps. Yes, so we can surely act as a, a guiding map to us for the surgeries. Exactly, so if uh, there are quite complex con cancerous cell can be there, where uh, you know doc doctors need to find and then you no know, uh, take it off and that time uh, when you feed that to the machine and it can find wherever is so that the doctor might not miss even one because ultimately if he goes through it you don't know like whether he misses one or not in that way he can always help uh, another question is there from the thumb He's asking, how do you train model with only convolutional and max pooling layer? What error function or optimizer is used? Okay, so um, here it's not just a for feed forward network. So what I showed is that uh, is a trained network. I'm just showing the uh, architecture of the uh, network. It consists of convolutional new, I mean convolutional layers, pooling layers. Uh, let me share again once again. So here you see, this is just one um, a network architecture, meaning it consists of a convolutional layer, pooling layer, etc. But to train this network, meaning to train uh, the weights of each layer, uh, you need to back propagate it again, right, with a loss function. And for that, here, since it's a key point regression, we use the loss function of um, mean absolute error, meaning we have to absolutely find the position, local position of coordinate of the key point. So for that, we use loss function as MAE, and then the optimizer used is ADAM. There are plenty of optimizers. Optimizers is to, you know, you have a loss function, 
and you have to find the global minimum of that loss function meaning global minimum is you have to find the minimum of that loss of your particular data so how fast you can reach to that global minimum and how efficiently you can reach reach to the global minimum is what the optimizer does so there are plenty of optimizers available you can see and we used adam uh, optimizer here and this faster rcnn again if you ask for a loss function here so it's like two it has two loss functions one is classification loss uh, which is cross entropy uh, loss function and then uh, another thing is a localization loss again so that's an l1 loss l1 is nothing but ma again so that's what Okay, so is it like a uh, like a trial and error basis that you try the loss functions and uh, optimize no, it or um, actually, uh, calculate and something? Yeah, actually, for loss function, it's not a trial and error. So you know, for for a, there is defined loss function for uh, defined uh, application. For example, here if I am classifying. I mean, given a, co a comet image, it's a valid comet or invalid comet. There is a classification loss. Classification loss. If it's just two two classes are there, so it's binary cross entropy. And if it is multi class are there, you have multi class, you know, uh, cross entropy function. And if if for this particular one, since you know the loss function for regression, regression is nothing but the continuous values. So for continuous values, you have functions like MAE, MSE. See, you have uh, uh, intuit. I mean, you have uh, you have to find a loss function based on your data and based on your application. For example, in my data, if I have so many uh, outliers, meaning if I have so many uh, images that can be neither comet, neither anything, it can be something else totally different from. The whole data set available, then you should not approximate your value, your your finding your finding findings towards that. Meaning, you should not consider those outliers. If you if you there use MAE, what happens? It will take the uh, absolute loss of that outlier. But if you use MSE, what happens? It will square the error, right? So the error will be really high. So you will neglect those outliers, but in 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 MAE, it is just absolute error, and there is a chance that you won't neglect those error. So based on your data, based on your application, you you will know as you learn along. It's not trial and error. You will know what to use, what not to use, based on if you analyze and do feature engineering on your data. Yes, so it's like uh, we have to analyze the data and just think for ourselves what may what may fit perfectly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, we had a similar question of that sort. Like, can you tell some technologies or to go all the algorithms to use or solve problems as a data scientist? Uh, to solve problems like? Uh, it's not clear dimension. Uh, okay. Jackson, if you can please elaborate on that, it will be good. Uh, till then, we'll just take the next question. It's from Pratham again. Uh, what kind of hardware is used for training and testing uh, large models? Okay, so um, you know it depends. Like uh, deep learning, right? So we need this GPU architectures, NVIDIA, GTX. You have so many. Uh, I know. Um, yeah, there are GPU clusters. You have uh, RTX, and you have. If you go, if you use, a, uh, it's always I recommend using AWS. In AWS, you have plenty of consoles available, and you have plenty of you know uh, storage capacities, different for different uh, usage. And also, it also uh, you have inbuilt uh, machine learning libraries in that you don't have to again go for all installation. That's that's major. Uh, headache for if you have a local system with you. So you have P3, P, P3, P2, P1, T2, T3, T1 like that. So it all has, it's based on how many GPU you have inside. Uh, how, I mean, in a cluster consists of how many GPUs and then each GPU's capacity. Okay. 
four GB, five GB like that. So for a large scale model like this, I think you need of a GB at least of a GPU, and then uh, if if you talk about this uh, Nvidia, you are you the minimum that I would choose is GTX one zero eight zero. That's what I used for this particular model, you know, uh, to train this and all, and it's uh, quite good. Yeah, I feel like cloud computing is the way to go. Like, yeah, that's the best of the mm -hmm. hardware. Yep, that's the best thing I would uh, suggest anyone who's entering here, uh, you know, into when you want to, uh, you know, uh, like try and with different experiments, if you want to experiment different things, I would always suggest uh, AWS. Okay, AWS is where you have to pay. So I would also suggest you can use Kaggle. I hope everyone must have known about Kaggle. If not, I'll tell you like, um, let me share. So Kaggle gives you open source GPUs and everything. So uh, you can sign in here. I'll just quickly show you guys. Okay. So uh, you you can you will have plenty of competitions where you can attend. So that's where this is how I learned data science. So you will have competitions, NLP, computer vision, you have so many competitions here. You can uh, code there and you have so many data sets, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to code, you can create a new notebook. Like it's nothing but our Jupyter notebook. And you have free accelerators, GPU and TPU and all. And this gives you some, I think, nine hours of seamless running of GPU and you get uh, 30, I think, hours, 30 hours per week in an account for GPU, as well as TPU. TPU get, I think, 40 hours, something. And seamlessly, you can work for nine hours. Uh, I mean, you can make it run at the background for nine hours. So it's like free GPU you get. That's where I started with without having any uh, hardware in hand. And this is quite good. You can use this Kaggle or always you always you must have known about Google Colab. But I prefer Kaggle more than that because uh, you can, there is Google Colab Pro right now, which is better, but Kaggle is always better. You have data and you can add your data as you can do it, whatever you want to. Yeah. Yes, I guess yeah, everyone would be knowing Kaggle. If, yeah, uh, I guess. Over in pro, then we can arrange a session for all of you on that. So you can just drop it or drop that in the comments. Uh, so there is one more question from Jackson. Uh, could you give some tips for students aiming to get a data science job? Okay, so uh, first, mm, I would say showcase your uh, skills. If you learn them and then if you, uh, you know, put, uh, learn them and then if you do it that's not enough apparently right now in in you know in this competitive world i ha i would say you have to actually showcase your skills a lot so do a project be it a simple project make a demo video of your project put it in uh, you know you know in linkedin or any uh, write a blog about it uh, publish a blog about it and uh, make a video of it and then put it in LinkedIn, just tag people. Do that. You showcase. You showcase your skill and that would definitely help, uh, you know, knowing about you well. How how good are you with your skills? How, you know, competitive are you? So that's that's the main thing that I would look for anyone or uh, my myself have done. And... Apart from that, uh, I mean, uh, the theoretical way of learning data science is no of no use. So I would recommend everyone to try uh, practically with code yourself, everything, and then go see some other code and just do reverse engineering. Uh, try to replicate it. You, you might have seen many codes in Kaggle, but how, many, how much of the code that if you run it works is 
less. So try them. Uh, I, I know if if you if you couldn't replicate it, ask and replicate it, and that's I think yeah that would definitely help you. And make 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 yourself you know uh, outside in the world, come out of your comfort zone and put videos and write blogs. Nowadays, whoever is a recruiting manager, if they see your profile, they either look whether you are in any blogging. uh are you blogging or are you uh having a well maintained git up or are you having any kaggle um you know met any uh medals in kaggle uh, that that's what basically in data science people see so keep doing that yes i guess we should not just copy and paste the code like if, if we should do that only if we understand it completely Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So keep because there are plenty of uh, solution available for almost all problems in Kaggle or in GitHub. But how how what what innovative you think that you uh, give it to? For example, there are plenty of codes available, and same algorithm. I mean, same face recognition. It be what newly you do with that face recognition? Where do you apply it in a new place? I mean, where it is not present right now. so that's where your talent you know speaks same algorithm but different application yes uh, so like in continuation to that uh, uh, like do you feel like uh, many of the times when we start learning uh, new stuff uh, from online courses or other things uh, most of the projects that we see uh, are common like the handwriting digit recognition with the mnist dataset and all these are some like uh, common projects so are those enough to build a profile or uh, should we go out of the box and think for something else exactly it's definitely a, not it's enough same. yeah it's definitely not enough no one will look for mnist again so or the fashion mnist anything it even cat versus dog that's quite common in everywhere whatever that's a basic thing for you to learn like learn what is cnn learn how a deep learning architecture works but the same thing you can you know implement in something else and you can really see a different uh, way of you know uh, working cnn i mean mnist is very simple data and how it behaves for a simple data and how it behaves for a complex data that that's where like you have to explore don't stop yourself with mnist you know whatever you learned with that go and i know replicate it in some other data set and you will definitely find it interesting and uh, you know to uh, improve it you will also look for some other solutions so go for something that's not being done same or it, it, it can be same method but not been done on the on that data set that something that i showed you right now is like very rarely done but the same key point regression is done everywhere in facial key points and etc but it's not it's not used in biomedical uh, dna analysis and all so that's that's how you show like what exactly you have i mean what how, how do you think etc yes, so basically the concept is the same the application varies yeah so that that's how you start i mean that's how you uh creating new uh, concept is different but when you have to understand the concept completely and all the nook and corners because still ml is a black box right so to understand it in more clear way you all you can do is experiments right now and explain it in an experimental way a empirical way not exactly you can explain the uh, ai so this is how you start and then you make up concepts i mean you make up architectures yes sure uh one uh, other question is there uh any tips for students aiming for research uh, side in ai ml uh come again uh, uh, he's asking for tips for students aiming for the research field in ai ml okay so i myself worked in you know research field for a while and then i was in iit kanpur you know doing uh helping as a, one of the research people so uh i would say um 
you have to publish more papers, uh, not just normal conferences. There are conferences like CVPR, which is uh, Computer Vision and pa uh, Pattern Recognition, and then you have NIPS, you have uh, other IEEE uh, conferences, which is uh, don't go don't go for uh, if you if you are aiming for conferences, this is the best that you can see. CVIP, CVPR, NIPS, and then next you should go for journals and transactions. So uh, publish more papers that will help you for uh, research. And um, I mean, if you go and search for a, you know Microsoft or Google research people, they, they are always looking for new minds. Go talk to them. I mean, talk to uh, research people in Google DeepMind and uh, Microsoft and then in FAIR, et cetera, et cetera. So you just go there and then talk to people and see what they are working on and try to. So more the context, more research ideas you get and more collaboration you get because for research people ask for collaboration. I mean, you you might you might be someone like with the computer science program, you know to code, you know to make algorithms, you know to uh, make use of the data set. But where you put, where you apply them, um, from, may, might be from complete, you know, medical uh, guy or complete um, mechanical person or something else. So collab, take take an initiative for collaborative research. So go for people who's looking to clear complex problems and uh, who have no idea about AI. Go and make your make your AI contribution to them, which will lead to a good paper. Oh, I guess I think you should start by just building connections on LinkedIn and other places. So that yeah. You can get somewhere. Yeah, sure, sure. Ask me, I mean, anytime I'll be, uh, Available and do uh, keep following uh, uh, new papers, whichever I mean, research right now in going on. Uh, I mean, read new papers, keep reading papers, it will help you write more papers. So, and if you have any uh, queries or any tips or anything, it be in my uh, uh, I mean, you can always contact me through LinkedIn or through mail, I'll be available. In continuation to that, he's asking like, what college year is appropriate for starting to publish papers, research papers? Nothing. <laughs> you know, uh, you have. I mean, you have to jump in. <laughs> you have to jump in and then start. There's nothing like you need in uh, as a. There's no age to start the start start it. Sorry? There's no particular year to start it. You can just go with it whenever you are comfortable. No, it's like start now. I mean, first year, even 12th people are uh, students are interested in writing papers. Start in first year. I mean, start second year. I mean, just take, if you start reading papers, you will know how much simple problems are solved with, you know, in a, See, in, when, when you come to papers, it's like uh, how much a layman can understand your, understand your paper, that much uh, citation you get in your paper. So you have to write very simple papers. So it's not like you have to solve a complex problem and then uh, you have to make um, uh, innovations and then uh, to, just start with a very simple thing, whatever that you learn right now. Uh, same thing you use for different data sets. And you will come up with some analysis, right? Something new, something new you could find that uh, something is not available, like uh, how this architecture is behaving for this data and something new that you can find from that. Make a note of it and write it as a paper. I, I wouldn't say there is a right year for you to you know, start with the paper. I'm saying right now is the best time to start with the paper. So I guess you can take the tips from her. You can start right away. Uh, we have another question from Ashwin. He is asking, I'm thinking of recreating a picture into 3D model using 3D point cloud data. Uh, how should he proceed with that? 
Okay, so um, from an from a single image to three D. Uh, yeah, I'm creating a picture into a three D model. Okay, so I mean, I would say like there are some there is something called a uh, uh, kitty data set where actually you can uh, see uh, finding a three D uh, disparity map. Between images, so I think that's how you have to start with it because for from a single image, always you don't know a depth knowledge, right? So how do you define a depth in an image? Given two images, stereo images, stereo images, something two images which has sixty percent of overlap. Okay, start with that. Uh, I mean, find the disparity between two images. There is a mathematical calculation for that. If if the two images has an overlap. Of x direction or y di also y direction. So I I would say start with that, uh, start with explore that data set, explore that problem, and then you will find the way. I think that's that's a basic that you have to actually understand. Well, so I guess that helps with uh, your question, Ashwin. Or uh, do we have any more questions? No, I think we can conclude the session. So, just, uh, thank you so much, Harindi ma'am, for the wonderful and insightful session. It was a pleasure having you among us, and I think everyone feels the same. Um, that brings us to the end of our session as well as our event. However, we have one last announcement to make, and I'm sure you all are eagerly looking forward to it. Yes, it's about the leaderboard, and we have our top five winners of the event. I'll just share the screen and announce the top five winners. So, can you just confirm if my screen is visible? Not yet. Can you see now? No, it's still not visible from my side at least. Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, good. So are uh, the top five. So the at the fifth position, we have an image with 3,300 points. Uh, at the fourth position, we have Ashwin R with 3,580 points. At the third place, we have Tresa with 3,830 points. In the second place, we have Soumya Rajan with 3,870 points. And the top of the leaderboard is Muni Jayanath with 4,140 4, points. So those were our top five of the CV week uh, daily quizzes and the Kahoot session all included. So congrats to the top five winners. We request you to kindly drop your VIT Bhopal email IDs in your in the chat box so that we can uh, communicate with you for the uh, uh, prizes and awards that you will be getting. So a hearty congratulations to all the winners and to everyone who showed active participation and enthusiasm throughout the event. Lastly, we would like to thank each and every member of the audience who has shown immense support and loyalty over the past two weeks. We hope everyone has taken something valuable from all the sessions conducted. A big thank you to all the faculty members who interested their belief and blessed us with the opportunity to conduct this event. This event would not have been possible without the sheer support of our student coordinators, all the leads of all the teams, and the entire team of AI Club. AI Club aims to bring equally interesting and amazing sessions to you, and we hope to see you all joining in and showing your support. Till then, take care, everyone, and see you all very soon. Thank you.